How can we treat depressive disorders in patients with cancer? Well, similarly to treating depression in other patients, we do want to make sure that we educate patients about the symptoms of depression, the diagnosis, and the forms of treatment. Sometimes just the education itself can have a therapeutic effect and provide the patient with the relief of understanding of what's going on with them and why they're feeling the way they're feeling. Some patients may opt just for psychotherapy, and there are different forms of psychotherapy, including cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness-based therapies, or meaning-centered psychotherapy, whatever is appropriate and the best fit for a particular patient. Some patients may prefer spiritual counseling. In addition to these therapeutic modalities, there will be a subset of patients that can benefit from an antidepressant, usually patients who have depression at a moderate to severe level. We want to educate patients that antidepressants are not addicting. That's one of the most common fears that patients have and one of the most common barriers to them accepting the treatment. I'll talk a little more about the antidepressants and what are the general principles of prescribing antidepressants in patients with cancer. I would suggest that you take a similar approach one would take to a geriatric patient. So start low and go slow. Obviously, if you have a patient where going slow is not appropriate and you need to be a little more aggressive with your titration, perhaps it's a younger patient who can handle that then absolutely that is appropriate to do. But overall, we do want to be careful. We want to remind the patients that the effect of the medications takes a few weeks. It is important to provide the patient with a regular follow-up, whether it's a phone call or office follow-up. As we know, patients sometimes self-discontinue medication if they experience side effects that they don't understand or they feel that they cannot tolerate. Or some of them may not feel better right away and they stop the medication assuming that it's not working. So we want to follow up with the patient and we want to keep an eye on them and titrate the medication further up as appropriate. Once the symptoms have remitted, or at least most of them remitted, so we have at least a 50% remission and improvement, we want the patient to continue on the antidepressant for some time. I generally counsel patients they should stay on the antidepressant for at least a year. If they have never had an episode of major depressive disorder before, then at one year of treatment, we can evaluate whether they want to continue or see how they do without the antidepressant. For patients who've had prior episodes of major depressive disorder, their chances of having another one are pretty high. So I may recommend that they continue on the antidepressant indefinitely as long as it's effective for them. If the patient does not respond sufficiently to one antidepressant, we should not give up and we should try another agent even within the same class. Sometimes we can combine different agents from different classes, for example, an SSRI with bupropion or an SNRI with bupropion. Bupropion is a norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitor, particularly helpful in patients who struggle with fatigue and a lot of apathy, patients who are smokers and would like to stop smoking. This, again, may be a good agent to start with. As we know, it's not an antidepressant that treats anxiety, and in fact, anxiety can be one of its side effects. So we want to keep that in mind. If we have a patient who has depression, but also a lot of anxiety, this may not be the best first-line choice. And we also need to keep in mind the potential for a lower seizure threshold, particularly at higher doses. So patients who have brain tumors or history of alcohol use and are at risk of alcohol withdrawal for those, this medication also would not be the best choice. Fluoxetine may be appropriate for some patients who, for example, are MPO or have an intermittent bowel obstruction because it is the longest acting SSRI and can be administered once a week. Some of the dose formulations may be preferable and determine which antidepressant one chooses to use. So, for example, pill versus liquid. SNRIs are commonly used, especially in patients who have comorbid neuropathy, which is a very common problem as a result of chemotherapy. 
SNRIs are a reasonable choice for depressed cancer patients with pain that is not completely responsive to opioids as SNRIs can help with the perception of pain and may have a potential co-analgesic benefit. So duloxetine or venlafaxine or desvenlafaxine are the most commonly used antidepressants from this category. Venlafaxine is a first-line choice for patients with breast cancer who are on tamoxifen maintenance as venlafaxine does not have any 2D6 inhibitory action and therefore it is safe to combine. You could say the same about desvenlafaxine. We want to avoid duloxetine in patients who have hepatic or renal disease. Levomelnacipran has been used as an antidepressant in Europe, but in the United States, it's only indicated or approved for fibromyalgia. Another very commonly used antidepressant in patients with cancer is mirtazapine. Mirtazapine is a serotonin and norepinephrine increasing antidepressant that is also possible to administer as a sublingual orally disintegrating tab, which can be very beneficial for patients who have trouble swallowing, for example, due to painful mouth sores. It is a pretty sedating antidepressant, so we use it also as a sleep aid for some of our patients at 7.5 or 15 milligrams. I prefer to use mirtazapine or trazodone for sleep rather than a benzodiazepine or other so-called Z drugs because of the lack of addiction potential. Mirtazapine can also help some patients with nausea and appetite stimulation. One thing to keep in mind is that there have been case reports of neutropenia with mirtazapine. Some of the older antidepressants, like tricyclic antidepressant amitriptyline, notriptyline, are generally not used as first-line treatment of depression or anxiety in patients, but you may still see them used by our colleagues in neurology or supportive medicine for management of neuropathy or chronic headaches. Some of the most common side effects, particularly initially in treatment, include nausea, diarrhea, headache, tremor changes in sleep. For some patients, it can be sleepiness, or for others, it can be insomnia. Hyponatremia or bleeding abnormalities are relatively uncommon. We want to keep in mind possible drug-drug interactions. SSRIs in general have low drug-drug interaction potential with the exception of paroxetine and fluoxetine, which are both potent 2D6 inhibitors. As we know, citalopram has a warning about QTC prolongation. Escitalopram is a similar medication which does not carry the same warning. If the patient wants to stop the antidepressant, it's always better to taper it off gradually, particularly antidepressants like paroxetine or venlafaxine. Some of the other agents to consider include medications like stimulants. So, for example, methylphenidate at doses between 2.5 to 10 milligrams per dose can be very helpful for patients who are profoundly depressed, of very low energy. You really need them to start engaging with physical therapy, occupational therapy, and you cannot wait those three, four weeks for the SSRI or SNRI to kick in. For those kinds of patients, adding a low dose of stimulant may be very helpful. If methylphenidate is not doing the job, you can try other stimulants, for example, from the group of dextroamphetamines. All of these medications are really rapidly acting for fatigue, apathy, and mood, and may actually be a good choice for patients who are terminally ill, who cannot really afford the time to wait for a typical antidepressant to work, as stimulants may really improve their mood much more rapidly. I do have patients who don't necessarily struggle with depression, but do struggle with significant fatigue, for whom I would use a low dose of stimulant for that purpose. Ketamine has become more and more popular in treatment of depression in the general population. It is a drug that has been used in general anesthesia. It's an NMDA antagonist, and at a low dose IV administration can actually rapidly relieve treatment-resistant depression. However, the duration of the effect can vary widely and the doses often need to be repeated. 
In patients with cancer, we don't really have a lot of data on the use of ketamine, but there are certainly patients for whom this may be an appropriate alternative. For example, patients who are terminally ill or patients who have ongoing pain issues where ketamine could help them with both pain and depressive symptoms. As a second line, I would think about modafinil, which is a medication with dopamine-enhancing effect. Sometimes the cost of the medication can be a barrier for patients to use it. In summary, antidepressants are the first-line treatment, particularly for moderate to severe forms of depression, favorable side effects, and possible effectiveness for other symptoms, for example, hot flashes or pain, should also be taken into consideration when we are selecting an antidepressant. Some non-antidepressant agents, such as stimulants, can often be used safely and effectively as an augmentation of antidepressant treatment, especially in the first weeks of starting an antidepressant, or for patients who have chronic significant fatigue or chemotherapy-induced cognitive issues, such as difficulties with focus.